Hey, everybody, Economic Ninja, I hope you're doing well. We're going to be talking about cryptocurrency, but not just any cryptocurrency. We're actually going to be talking about a crypto token today. If you have ever heard of DeFi, it stands for Decentralized Finance. That's if you haven't heard about it. We're here with Reggie Middleton. Reggie Middleton is the creator of Veritasium, the token that sits on the ERC-20 platform. And I have been an investor ever since the IPO. And it has had, to say the least, some struggles, but it has also had, to say the least, an amazing opportunity to take over and transform the world of DeFi. So without, uh, oh, I got nothing else to say. So let's just jump right in. Reggie, how are you doing? I'm fine. Um, I'd like to just jump in. So I've had a lot of uh, unpleasant litigation action, litigious action with uh, powerful entities. And so, you know, investor and IPO, I understand those words are, uh, easy to roll off because it's convenient or uh, but you know there are certain nuances or not so nuanced um differences that uh i had to fight and argue over but that's not really the topic of this discussion i just want to make sure i just jump in you know what I agree with that. i'm so glad you said that actually because you're right i am guilty of that i throw out these terms but there's actually very specific ways to speak about things so so that everybody knows i own some tokens the very tokens and i was a part of um i've been around since the beginning so i i just want you to know that i had, had um purchased some a long time ago and so uh, hopefully i i cleared that up reggie it, well it, you know if you don't mind um we had a quick discussion earlier yeah. and you were discussing uh, asking me about leasing the tokens and using them and um, not selling them, et cetera, actually making use of the utility. Yeah. You bought them for the right reason and you understood what they were for, but the vernacular that you're used to using because you know the internet, Wall Street, et cetera, is vernacular that certain bad actors or adversarial parties latch onto and then attribute things towards me and the company that, you know, in my opinion, to start to. So that's a long-winded way of saying, you know, you have to be very careful what you mean and what you say are not necessarily corollary. And then, you know, people could jump on that. You know, and and I'm glad you went there because let's talk about that. Um, <clears throat> I did not invest in a company. I actually purchased the right to use a software, in my opinion. That's, I, I, I saw an ability for a package of software tools that could be used in the future um, to conduct peer-to-peer -peer transactions. And I thought it was amazing. And so just like I have to now, it just drives me nuts. I can't go and buy a disc for QuickBooks and go install it on my computer. I have to buy a subscription. Um, I invested in a, uh, a piece of software to conduct peer-to-peer -peer transactions if it's able to run. Is that a better way of putting it, Reggie? Yeah, definitely. It's yeah. the truth. Yeah, because it is the truth because that is, and you're right. And, I, and this is actually a great, I think this is maybe a great in, um, interview because not a lot of people, and I'm guilty of it, I throw these words out, IPO, ICO, investing, um, and I don't exactly know sometimes because the technology in cryptocurrency has completely transformed the way that we not only um, understand uh, traditional financial markets, but how they are being transformed into totally new markets. Would that be a good way to think about it? Yeah, I mean, things are changing. Um, when you discuss what the token was for, um, and software enabling peer-to-peer -peer transactions, uh, I came up with this idea in 2013. Um, I did, you know, uh, created the software. I did working examples, fully functional betas, uh, tried to raise money, you know, went through the whole business, uh, you know, rigmarole. Um, yeah. I uh, was approached by regulators. Uh, they felt that my promises or proclamations, predictions were unrealistic and fraudulent. Fast forward, and I was actually very, very uh, pessimistic. You know, things are bigger than I said they were. Everybody's taking over. Um, the lucky part was we filed patent applications very early in 2014. Um, and that's very exciting. Those software tokens, without the government interference, would have allowed those who purchased it to basically um, control decentralized finance and peer to peer capital markets um, throughout the first and third largest economies in the world as of right now. And that is um, pure fact. Now, when, 
when people start to hear peer-to-peer finance, they I think a lot of people are very misunderstood, but a lot of people do understand county counterparty risk. Um, and that is one thing that I'm really against. I, I don't want some a middleman in between me trying to buy something from someone else. And that is what you also felt and what you wanted to combat back in 2013, right? Well, in, in a nutshell, it's a slight oversimplification. I'm not against middlemen. I'm against middlemen who don't add value. So a middleman that doesn't add value is known as a rent seeker. It's basically someone who takes something that they don't deserve. So um, let's assume that the internet and the um, telecommunications packages that stand between um, you and I, yep. Zoom, the network, et cetera, is a middleman. I have no problem paying for that because it has significant value. Without that, we can have this discussion. One of us would jump on a plane and do a six hour trip, okay? Um, so that is value add, okay? But that's not a middleman, that's actually technology between us. Um, and middleman who would be a rent seeker would be a broker who stands in between two people who normally would be able to find each other, but the broker stands in between, prevents you from finding each other, then charges you a fee for finding each other. Yeah. They are simply taking money just because. They have no value added uh, reason to be there. They should be removed. And when you remove them, the money, revenues, and profits that they make can be redistributed amongst everybody who uh, participates in the transaction. So it's good for everybody except for the rent seeker who should have been in the first place. Well, and it's funny, um, the rent seeker, as you say, uh, could be watching a video like this and all of a sudden get a bright idea and go, Maybe I want to dig into what Veritasium is and, and these peer-to-peer -peer markets because I may want to jump on board and use it myself, wouldn't you say? Well, eventually that's going to be the case. You have rent seekers who are more entrepreneurial and more uh, aggressive in a value-added perspective. Then you have those who are very aggressive in uh, the oligarchical um, uh, Luddite perspective where they attempt to maintain the status quo. The status quo can never be maintained because life goes on, um, technology, you know, consistently develops over time and things change. As a matter of fact, the only constant there is, is change. So um, you have two different types. Unfortunately, both the rent seekers or both types of rent seekers tend to have very, very large uh, power hooks into the infrastructure of society, political, capital, financial, um, and social. And they can do a very, very phenomenal job in preventing disruption from the smaller entrepreneurial sources. Yeah. Um, every now and then, one of those smaller entrepreneurial sources are able to break through, but it happens seldomly, seldom, and it usually takes political capital because yeah. there's a danger. The regulatory bodies um, are um, purportedly out to protect the consumer, the little man, but often, in my personal experience, they protect the oligarch, the extent, and the status quo. Now, it could be that I'm very biased because I'm the entrepreneurial, you know, David versus a client. But that has been my, you know, experience, my personal experience. And I'm an economic historian. I'm not an economist, but I'm a student. I study. And that's what I've seen until it comes to the point where technological change is inevitable. And that's when you have the breaking business models, the compression of margins, and the elimination of the old with the inbringing of the new. You know, and David and Goliath is a great analogy here because that is what we're facing right now in this world. And, and anyone that listens to the Economic Ninja channel knows that I am about community and change in the world, but we can't do it unless we're strong ourselves. And I've watched you take on the big boys because there are people that wish to hold back society and, and continually keep them under, you know, charging them for services that they shouldn't be charged for or getting them into debt that they shouldn't be in debt for. Um, and, and I do appreciate your tenacity because to say, you know, you've been hit hard, you know, it, it's a lot to take on some of these giants, but you may have been down some at some point, but you're not out. So let's talk about these patents because I remember the one when Japan came out and the Japan patent was granted and it was exciting. And there were people that might've said, well, yeah, but it's Japan, but Japan's massive. 
And and that was a huge victory, absolutely huge. But yeah, just, but it's Japan. It's the third largest economy in the world. So. Exactly. Thank you. Yeah, but it's like people, Americans, that would have talked down about Japanese cars in the late seventies, only to now, you know, they're just they were destroying the market, you know, uh, in America, just crushing American car makers, you know, for so long. So they said the same thing about that patent. Now, what just happened? Well, the U.S. granted a patent issued it officially on the 7th of December. Um, and that patent is similar to the Japanese patent, but actually slightly stronger. Um, and Japan is the world's third largest economy. It's the world's second largest crypto economy, especially from an enterprise perspective. Most people don't realize that. And the largest is the US. So now I have the first and third. There may be others coming. There are definitely gonna be others who won't come through, we'll see. But my worst case scenario is that I am the acknowledged founder of peer-to-peer -peer capital markets, of which the subset is DeFi in the US and Japan. Um, this is very big because a lot of people don't understand what DeFi is in the peer-to-peer -peer capital markets. Uh, they think of DeFi as Uniswap or Aave or Compound. Um, those are small entrepreneurial companies. The largest consumers of the DeFi technology are the money center banks. JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, MasterCard, Visa, et cetera. Um, I can tell you right now, practically everything they're doing in conditional value transfer is my idea. And now I have patent protection over it. Yeah, and I'm sitting here, I'm sitting here giddy. Sorry, Reggie can see me. You can imagine how I was when I got the notice. <laughs> I'm sitting there like this because like Reggie just said, and I want you guys to realize this, when he said these are small um, enterprise banks, when we're talking about Uniswap and stuff, we're talking about those small guys are the multi-billion dollar groups. The, and, and he's right. They're the small ones. I want you to realize this. Reggie Middleton has been granted a patent in Japan and U the United States for DeFi. That is a big deal. And I'm excited. And we've seen it in the price, right? The price has shot up um, for the token. And we're not here to necessarily talk about the token. We're talking about the behind the scenes, right, Reggie? Right. The, the token, um, I decided to consent to give up in my fight with the SEC. Um, I look back, not the, nobody won from the crypto community uh, about with the SEC that I know of, okay? Except for potentially EOS, um, Block One, which is the author of EOS. Um, they paid a $24 million fine, which seems like a lot until you realize they raised $4.1 billion four years ago, um, which is now, assuming they didn't spend anything, which is now seven times, five, six, seven, seven times four is- uh, 28? $28 billion. $28 billion. Yeah. So $24 million out of $28 billion yeah. is not even a slap on the wrist. Yeah. It's the extraction of one little tiny hair off the top of your hand. Yeah. So out, outside of uh, that party, nobody's really succeeded against um, the SEC. And even Block One doesn't look like they're knocking out of the park. No offense, but, you know, battles with regulators are just not the way to do business. Yeah. So I decided to concede. Uh, I did not like any of the terms at all. But uh, two years later, I'm back and probably bigger, better, stronger than ever. Um, right. I consider many of the people who follow me on social media they consider the patent to be um, a seminal event in the crypto industry, um, either right above or right below the Satoshi white paper in terms of importance. Um, that says a lot. Um, when I look at it that perspective, and I didn't, I can see your point. Um, this, last night, I didn't get much sleep. I was up mapping Ethereum over the patent banks. I'm about 80, about 65, 70% through thus far. Nice, perfect fit. If I get to the other 30%, um, that means that Ethereum itself infringes on the patent. I did this because we're going, we're looking at other ent um, ventures that infringe on the patent. Um, Ripple and on demand liquidity and Uniswap and um, the Bitcoin Lightning Network is a perfect fit because we came up with the idea back in 2014, et cetera, et cetera. But instead of, going, instead of looking at projects that infringe, if we look at the actual underlying protocol and if and when that infringes, then it makes things very, very simple. Yeah. Okay. If you use Ethereum, if you use the Lightning Network, if you use a uh, layer two, 
or a side change, you infringe. Now it doesn't matter what your project is, yeah. right? You're using a protocol. Yeah. One of the early marketing um, uh, slide decks that I came up with in 2014, was it 2014? 2014, um, it said, and this was produced by a regulator and they used it against me as being fraudulent. I'm not gonna opine on that. Um, it said, imagine having the keys to the internet in 1994. Um, and that's what I um, compared the patent applications to. Yeah. This was 2014. We have 10 more days, nine more days left to 2021. Mm -hmm. And I believe I have the keys to the internet in 1993. Um, if Ethereum maps on correctly, that means we'll probably get Cardano, EOS, Neo, and everybody else to map as well. If basically anybody uses a virtual machine, um, the most prominent part, the most utilitarian part of the Bitcoin network, which is the Lightning Network, et cetera. Um, very, very powerful position to be in. And it's unfortunate because this should be celebrated in this country. Um, instead, it was taken down, driven out of business and labeled as a fraud. Um, all my bank accounts were closed, brokerage accounts were closed, nobody wanted to do business with me. Uh, reputation, which took decades to build, and I had a sterling reputation for those who don't know I predicted the call of uh, the fall of Bear Stearns, the Lehman Brothers, the residential housing crash, commercial, Europe, et cetera. Let me jump All in there real quick. Destroyed. I watched that in real time, everybody. I watched Reggie back then talking about that on CNBC, just so you guys know. Yeah. Go ahead, Drake. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I discussed DeFi and CNBC in 2014. They gave me a lot of time. I ran to that nauseam. Um, so it's a sad that, you know, an American entrepreneur takes technology, he invents it in America um, to benefit America. And America has turned on him, labeled him a fraud, attempted to criminalize him and driven him out of business. Took all of his assets personally and um, corporate. It's sad. It really Can I is. rant for a second, Reggie? Go for it. I want to do business with you. And everyone on my channel knows, and, and this channel hasn't grown so uh, hard and fast uh, by just chance. It, it's been very blessed. And I tell everyone uh, that I invest in God's money, gold and silver. I invest in the people, people's money, like decentralized cryptocurrencies, like Digibyte, Bitcoin, Litecoin, things like that, because I want truth and I want transparency. And the truth is there's been a lot of smear campaigns put out about uh, Reggie um, and that I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I hope this sounds right, but that gets me excited, Reggie, because where there is light, darkness tries to, to snuff out light. But I'm telling you right now, guys, we are entering a time and a season where we're going to have an explosion of ideas, knowledge, understanding, and, and f it sounds crazy, but there is free markets about to pop out because there's so much suppression going on right now. What do you think about that, Reggie? Well, that's the whole premise of the idea. Um, my corporate title, you know, you have like CEO, CFO, manager. Uh, my corporate title was disruptor in chief. Um, remove the gatekeepers and let true capitalism reign. Now, there's a reason why a lot of governments and a lot of companies, a lot of people don't want true capitalism. True capitalism is meritorious competition, survival of the fittest. Yeah. So once you make it to the top, you probably made it to the top because you were one of the fittest or your ancestors were at some point. But once you get there, it is very, very hard to stay there for a significant amount of time because you cannot stay the fittest forever in perpetuity, which means it's someone else is gonna come and knock you off the throne. Your job is to make sure that everybody stays where they are and you stay where you are. Everybody else's job is to make sure you fall from that throne and they take it. Those who have the drive and the meritorious pursuits to attempt to do that. Um, that is all fine and dandy. But when artificial structures are created to prevent um, the rewarding of those who are more driven, smarter, stronger, with more perseverance, then that's how you devalue society as a whole and the country. Um, this is not uh, a software pursuit. And most people don't realize that Bitcoin, Ethereum, and all this is software, yes. right? They're not currencies, they're software, but they're software that enables certain things. Those certain things have a certain financial economic debt to it. But this is not about technology. It's not about software. It's not about finance. It's not about currencies. It's not about investing. It's about enabling um, old school barter, where you take your goods and services and can buy and sell it to somebody else. And without having these artificial constraints, 
these um, barriers, these rent seekers and middlemen who don't add value, um, you're able to flourish. The more successful we are, the more successful you are, and the more successful I am, the more successful the world is. Yeah. Okay. And I have no problem with capitalism. I love capitalism. I have no problem with people being wealthy or very, very wealthy, yeah. as long as they deserve to get there. And as long as the gates are open for everybody else to attempt to make that same trip, go for it. You know, because I'm actually against those who want to, you know, ban billionaires. I'm like yeah. a lot of people like to be a billionaire. But what you need to do is you need to ban the gate that protects the billionaires. Yeah. Because that's not how they become billionaires. And you want everybody else with the same opportunity. Just like those who don't work or who always cheat, they should fall. They should be allowed to fall. Okay. Yeah. And those who work hard should be allowed to rise in perpetuity, not just once one person gets to the top. Well, I'm going to say a big amen to that because I completely agree with you. And um, I don't want to hold you too long. I know you've got a lot of uh, interviews today. But in closing, is there anything you'd like to share? Um, I know this is going to probably go down and there's going to be a lot of people going, how do I buy very tokens? And I'm going to, I'm going to warn people right now. This is, I want you to, if you've never heard of Veritasium or Reggie Middleton, I want you to start studying. Go back and watch the old videos on CNBC of him warning about the housing crash when I was following him well over a decade ago. And I need, I want people to start to hear the story because that's a, a transition piece right now, right? The very token itself. Yeah, it is. Um, it, not, there were 100 million created back in 2017. Um, after litigation with the regulator, they took 98 million and froze them in that account through uh, judicial order. There's 2.15 million floating academically. Of that, you can assume 10 to 18 percent are lost, destroyed, et cetera, which means you have probably a little under $2 million, $2 million tokens floating around. Um, I am strongly considering, I haven't decided yet, there's a lot of ramifications, legal, you know, financial, economic, uh, that may prevent me from doing it. But I'm strongly considering using the tokens to discount um, licensing the IP. Um, let's take a best case scenario. Um, the best case scenario is Ethereum doesn't fringe. Um, we, I've already proven, I've already, you know, we did the research Lightning Network is a perfect fit. Yeah. Many side chains are a perfect fit. But if Ethereum infringes and a lot of the big top blockchains such as Solana, et cetera, infringe, that means if I decide to, I'll take an extreme. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying I'll do that, I'll take an extreme. Okay. If I decide to say to access this IP or to use what I have patented, you have to pay the very tokens. Yeah. Imagine the, what, six, seven trillion dollar crypto market growing at triple digits per year um, can only be accessed through under 2 million very tokens. Yeah. And when you're talking about the, the, the tokens themselves, are you referring to the around 2 million tokens that are out there in the metaverse right now? Or are you referring to the entire, is there a way of ever accessing those um, 98? Because I think a lot of people, 98 million, um, are afraid of those hitting the market someday because the SEC took them. Uh, okay. So let's explain. The tokens are prepaid licenses to use our products, services, intellectual property, intellectual capital. Yes. The patent is a, a tangible result or visible result of our intellectual capital. They're not securities. They're not anything special. They're prepaid licenses. Right. When you buy Microsoft Office, um, they amortize that purchase, and you can use that Office product for 12 months, yes. and you pay whatever, $200 to use it for that 12 months. The tokens are the same thing. Okay, when the tokens were taken, they broke the contract between the token buyer and Veritasium. Yes. Um, so Veritasium doesn't honor, doesn't have to honor that and cannot honor it yeah. because they were stripped of capital. Um, I've decided that I would do something probably unheard of or you know very rare in the industry, and I would attempt to honor it using a gentleman's agreement. You know because I think it's the right thing to do. Amen. There's no contractual reason. There's no legal reason. But I would try to reward those who stood behind me. If you didn't stand behind me, if you tried to sue me, if you did talk trash about me, et cetera, no, I will not do business with you. Yeah. The 98 million tokens, because they're going through the blockchain, they're easy to trace. It doesn't really matter what the SEC or the courts decide to do with them. I'm not going to honor them. That's right. So, they, can't, they can't just use them someday. 
they can use them. They just can't use it with me. So, and yeah. since I'm the only source of value, not me, right. but you know, our operations are the only source of value. Yep. You know, because you know where those tokens are. You know, and that's something people need to know, which is great about a blockchain. You know where those tokens are, and if they ever came back into the mix, they would be useless. Just trace them right through the blockchain. Anything that came from that address is not to be you. Anybody who tried to do anything, you tried to defame the character, attack Barry Tasting, sue me or the companies, you disrespect my children. You know, there's so many things that went on. You yeah. know, you know, you aided in the illness or death of my mother, anything like that, I won't do business with you at the very least. Yeah. Okay. Well, and I want everyone to remember this too. And this interview is going a little long. And, and I'm, I know there are so many uh, people that are fans of you, Reggie, that are on the edge of their seat right now. And I want to thank you for everything you've done. Uh, and I want to, the one thing the Economic Ninja invests in is people. And I have looked up to Reggie. And uh, someday we'll have to tell the story about the uh, third party that lost those tokens and me calling you in the middle of the night. I got your phone number. <laughs> but uh, it's a funny story. But um, I invest in people. And I think, I, I'm telling you right now, I, I really look up to Reggie Middleton. And I am very grateful uh, for the opportunity that I have had in the past to interview him. I haven't covered Veritasium in a long time because there's just a lot of unknowns. And sometimes it's better to let the man fight the way he needs to fight. And um, that's why a lot of you ask me, why haven't you had him on lately? Because of all these patents. And it's like, we're just wait. And, and I just want to thank you, Reggie, for, for allowing me to be able to tell your story or help you tell your story. Thank you. And, and, you know, I'm humble, by the way. Thank you, for real. Um, you mentioned the tokens, and there was a theft in the summer of 2017. Yeah, well, um, I didn't say that, the theft. I just said there was, <laughs> I was trying. But, yeah, you so, want to tell the story? Yeah, you can say that because all the guys have been caught. There are five of them. Um, one has been um, waiting for sentencing, but he's been indicted. He, he pled. He's waiting for sentencing. Um, one is being extradited from the UK, or that's the fight. Uh, if they show an extradition, he's going to be tried there. One has just been picked up in Georgia, Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, the other one, I don't know what's happening to him. Um, it's unfortunate because these a lot of these were young kids, but um, I'll let you in on a secret. I spent almost a million dollars defending myself against that suit because everybody tried to stick the theft on me. Yeah. And this is how nonsensical that is. Unlike other token um, ICOs, yeah. uh, the assets were mine that were taken. I had no reason to do a rug pull because it was mine. So trying to show that I stole my own assets, it's a total waste of everybody's time. Well, kind of it's, standard, it's, you know, it's insane. stealing somebody else's assets, but. Yeah, and the reason why we know you didn't do it is because it, it would have shed negative light on the project itself. But I want to share this. I got to share the story. So what it was was a third party that was in charge for custodying a certain amount of, of tokens, and they screwed up their security. Right, Reggie? Yeah, well, it, yeah, I got to say it was a sim swap. It was T-Mobile because this gotcha. is public. I have a lawsuit against T-Mobile now because <laughs> I was sim swapped swap like at least a half a dozen times. Yep. Um, I was able to find the addresses and names of several of the um, uh, alleged thieves. Yeah. I gave them to the party who was persecuting me and they ignored yeah. that and went after me anyway. Yeah. And nobody bothered to go after the thieves. So luckily, I'm not gonna name the party who was harassing me and yeah. doing these things, but I will give credit to Homeland Security and the Santa Clara um, Police Department. Awesome. Um, because they, you know, did their thing. Well, Too now bad. I got to I got to tell the story. The government aren't as willing to go after the bad guys versus the good guys, but you know, I will give credit. I'm not going to mention who did the persecution thing, but I will give credit where it's due to those two agencies. Yeah. Okay? So I got to tell the rest of the story. So in the middle of the night, I saw this on a backdoor exchange. Um, a bunch of the tokens hit the market, and I I grabbed them, and I'm like, something's wrong. I could, I looking in the wallet, I could see something different with the wallet. I don't want to go into what it was, the bottom of this wallet where all of the, you know, they were dumping these uh, tokens really cheap. I just, I, I got a hold of Reggie's phone number and I called him and it was three in the morning, uh, at New York time, East coast time. And he was awake and as cool as, <laughs> uh, it was as cool as a cucumber. And I said, Hey, uh, Mr. Middleton. And I told him my name and I said, uh, you don't know me, but I secured these if you want them, and, and he, he had 
confirmed, you know, confirmed, yes, they had been stolen. They're being dumped on the market right now. And I said, you can have them back if you want. And he goes, look, he goes, I'll tell you what, this isn't my place. We're working with the right authorities to take care of this, but thank you. And he was so kind and so cool. And I hung the phone up and my wife's like, did you really just talk to him? And I'm like, oh my gosh, that guy is so calm under pressure. <laughs> oh my God. But you, you, you had faith and understanding of the situation. And, and that's what I appreciate about you. So I, I really, and just so you guys know, guys, the first interview at the end of the first interview, the first time I officially met Reggie, I told him that story and he goes, well, that was you. Holy cow. <laughs> it was just a really neat thing. Uh, something we shared. And, and again, Reggie, I want to thank you. So um, it looks like we should get going because you got a bunch of interviews, right? Yes, I do. All right, well, let's get out of here, guys. With that being said, the Economic Ninja is out.